Welcome to Causing the Effect, a podcast focused on the exploration of your mind, body, and spirit. All right, guys, you got to tell me where this, the name of this podcast comes from. Everybody listening, YouTube, welcome. Uh, if you're listening, uh, you guys are just over the two-year mark of the Causing the Effect anniversary, so it's a big day. We're all here to enjoy it. Um, thank you guys so much for listening, for joining, all that good stuff, for the support. Uh, I have the team here from the podcast, maybe the best name ever, Clean Your Fucking House, Bitch. And um, where'd you guys get that name from? Let's start there. Well, I guess oh, I'll take it. It, it take is actually, it. Uh, yeah, uh, a weird situation. As we were coming together and deciding to even do the podcast, you know, of course, we we're going through, oh, what should we call it? Should we call it this or that? And quite frankly, we didn't want anything boring. We didn't want anything that's already out there and used and actually just um, the, the, the two simpler boring names. And as we were kind of feeding off each other, we just landed. And I can't remember who exactly said it. It could have been a combination of things. Maybe Kevin said fuck it's and Kevin Nancy said bitch way. and whatever. <laughs> but we just landed there because we're like, God damn, can't we just decide on something? Make a decision. Clean your fucking house, bitch. It, and it just kind of rolled right there because it's right in line with the kind of stuff we talk about and what we do. Is that, did you guys have any um, influence from Jordan Peterson for, with that name? No, unfortunately. No. Sorry, Jordan. Yeah, right. <laughs> was, you guys are just, thinking alike. It was just more of our own bullshit rolling between us, you know, and I think as we thought we were joking, we really landed on something that felt right. And everybody, for uh, if you're watching us, we have Lou Brown here to the bottom left, Nancy Bayheim to the bottom right, and my man Kevin Anderson top left here. Um, basically, what, what they're trying to the, the reason why I particularly loved your podcast is it seems like you guys are trying in the beginning of personal development or self help, whatever this you know want to call it. It feels like you have to add stuff to it. I have to become more courageous. I have to you know do this and that. And as I've gotten deeper into this process, it seems like you have to remove things more and be able to kind of eliminate the nonsense you don't need and, you know, remove the illusions or whatever to kind of just cl clarity is, is, is more or less what I would say. Is that something, it seems like that's kind of the summary of what you guys are trying to do. Um, would you agree with that? And what would you say is the biggest things that you guys have learned to kind of remove from your lives to make it more of a optimized kind of way of living? Absolutely is the intention of clearing the clutter, right? And that's mm -hmm. what cleaning your fucking house is about. We all carry excess baggage in some form or another. So how to let go and letting go is probably one of the hardest things for everyone to do. Um, and I think the first thing we had to do was let go of being worried about what people thought of the name and roll. All right. Like let, letting go is such a, um, it's such a simple thing, but it's such a difficult thing at the same time. Like for me, that's been the hardest in particular. Let pick, pick your poison, letting go of what people think of you, letting go of the fear, letting go of, you know, whatever. Um, for me, letting go of that old character, this, this, you know, that old version or identity of Scott with money or this or that, trying to become this this new version. Um, that 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 has been the issue. Um, for me, what has been the main issue? What has been the hardest thing for each of you to let go per se? And have you been successful, or is it a work in progress? Oh hell, whoever answers, it's a work in progress. <laughs> yeah, right. We do talk We're a lot human. about. We do talk a lot about how we cling to the past, and we certainly have talked about all of those things you mentioned, fear, uh, fear of rejection, fear of being different, conformity, all of those things. But the one that keeps coming up over and over again is clinging to the past. And Kevin oftentimes will throw a very interesting statistic that somewhere like 90 to 95 percent of our thoughts are of the past. And it's crazy when you actually force yourself to think about it. In other words, if you're in a moment and you're thinking about something, if you can catch yourself, shit, I was just thinking of something I did last year, the year before, somebody that pissed me off last week in traffic. It always seems to uh, almost center around that one thing. We, that's the biggest, dirtiest aspect of our houses that, uh, I, that should be cleaned, in my opinion, not just would be nice to have clean, but should be clean. Mm -hmm. And people would really be able to fill that with so much more positivity. Yeah. Um, for me, I think the biggest thing that I'm working on currently letting go is trying to control everything, like every outcome, um, every opportunity. I, you know, I find that when things don't work out, typically they don't work out for a reason. So just letting go and knowing that, you know, you put your best foot forward, you keep 
trying and everything will work out. I used to try to control everything in my life and it just really created a lot of stress, anxiety, you know. Mm-hmm. But you're still moving forward, yeah? Mm-hmm. After letting go. Do you feel okay about it? Do I feel okay about it? Yeah. Yeah, I feel all right. I mean, I'm trying to let go of the fact that my allergies are killing me right now. All that (laughs) cotton shit floating around in the air, just destroying me. Sorry. That sucks. It does. It does. I like most people, I say most, but maybe I'm wrong, but I worry too much about what others think and I have to let go of that. And I know my mind knows, but my brain and my mind conflict with each other. So yeah there's this it's, it's hard because like if you're an analytical thinker like i'm sure it sounds like me and nancy are similar like that's the, my one main thing is like, what do people think about me and it's one thing to say it right? i don't give a shit what people think but like yeah you do it's it it. it kind of how yeah. it is yeah and for me it's been funny because lou brought up the, the past just like understanding the way our mind works has been a key for me and i guess understanding these analytically just gives me like an ease and like from an anxiety standpoint like understanding that most of what our memories are made up of is incorrect. Like just understanding that from a science standpoint, like the things that I think were like the worst parts of my, like the worst things in my life, replaying them back are usually much worse than what they are. They're like understanding things from like an evolutionary standpoint. Like they're just there to make sure I don't die. Like that's it. That's really what, what the past is there for. Um, that's been kind of the key to getting through this thinker mind of, of, of mine. Have you guys used any kind of any? skills or situations or coping mechanisms to help you kind of work your way through these issues? Many. Um, (laughs) I think it's really about, you know, we talk a lot about how a plan is the thing that can keep you moving forward and you need an overarching goal that is the inspiration, I guess. And then you need the action steps. And if you have the two of those combined baby steps as you know, you hear this lots of places, not just us. If you're taking one little step forward each day, you're moving towards your overarching goal and you're not going backwards. You're not stagnant. You're doing something. You're making progress and you don't know what's next until you do what's next in front of you. So just to be able to keep moving at whatever pace is right for you. That's a interesting question. Coping mechanism. What immediately popped up for me is the fact that it's a little bit about uh, what others think about me and comparing ourselves to others as well kind of overlaps with that. And I always have to think, you know what, I have a unique set of skills, a unique set of talents, a unique way of looking at things. And sometimes some of that, oh, but that one has a a better job or that one has uh, more money or that one has a boat, whatever the case may be. I'll admit that does creep up every now and then. I think it's a natural thing for that to happen. But what we talk about in our podcast and what we practice is the fact that, okay, you have to keep uh, having that awareness and thinking that, okay, you know what? We are unique individuals. We have unique talents and we all bring that to the table with our clients. And of course, with the podcast. And I think it does help me to build my own confidence and self-esteem when I remind myself of that. Mm. What about you, Kev? Coping mechanisms. Um, I lean on meditation a lot to um, kind of control or at least become more aware of my emotions and my thoughts, what's going on. Um, It's difficult to not live in a reactive state with everything the way that you know the world is and life in general so trying to be able to choose responses versus reacting emotionally to things like i used to be a very angry person Mm -hmm. and um you know the the challenges with trying to adjust how i reacted to things um it was it you know, I basically just wasn't who I really wanted to be. So meditation kind of got me to a point where I was able to understand why I was pissed off all the time and uh, helped me to kind of just calm down. Like that's probably the biggest, you know, thing in my life that's yeah. helped me. No, I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you. That, I feel like that first step in, in anything of trying to solve it is finding the stillness. And 
you know, I love that you call it meditation. I can't call it meditation my little cousins because I think, you know, what's this hippie trying to tell me? Call it contemplation. Call it introspection. Call it whatever you want. Call it being off your phone for 15 minutes when you wake up. That is where you can kind of, I feel like anything you're trying to do, whether you're trying to be more still or trying to take more action, you have to have a sense of, you have to come to that first step in self-awareness of understanding where your strengths and weaknesses lie and also understand where your overvalue you know, with your overarching values life. For me, I chase money and girls and sex for my twenties. And it's like, Oh, I thought that's what kind of works. And then when you start readjusting um, and even what Lou said about the, this whole thing of being unique, like we realize we are unique, but also the thing you're implying with being unique is that you're different than everybody else. Right. And that's going to obviously make it a little more lonely. And for me, being on this journey, finding people like you, like you guys have been such a nice thing. Cause it kind of, I feel all of us lift each other in a certain way, but that first step of, of understanding that, uh, that awareness of seeing wh where everything lies, I think is the, is the first step and the crucial step for me, meditation has let me see the world on different levels from how people actually look at things. I started realizing, wow, people look at world from a physical perspective. Some people look at it from an economical perspective. Some people look at it from a psychological perspective and just being able to relate to people on these different levels and saying, okay, this person's looking at it from a, you know, my boss is looking at stuff from an economical perspective. Um, you know, the little cousins who are younger and into the women, they're looking at stuff from a physical perspective and trying to, so that's like what meditation does for me is help see everything in a different level and like brings my awareness like like from looking at the world 10 feet up to 100 and 150 feet up and and i think the byproducts of it of are just like letting go of the anger and stuff because like when you start that that i think is the, the reason why i started meditation and and i just want to feel less anxious be more it's kind of more of a selfish reason um and then as you go you understand that you need this tool to get, we all have that overarching vision that, that Nancy kind of mentioned that is going to pull you forward in those hard times, but to get pulled or, or to even see what the next step is, you need to have those 60, 90, maybe 120 day goals for me, having those 90 day goals is kind of perfect. Like 60 is too much. 90, 90 seems to be that, that good kind of piece for me. Um, do you guys have, you have that similar feeling like that one overarching goal? You probably all have that same thing. And maybe all of us do to help people to become better, create change, something like that. But then all, that's why I love this journey because we're all on it together in a way, but then how we get there is all going to differentiate just slightly. Yeah. yeah we're I all kind so. of on the same freeway, but we're yeah. traveling at different speeds. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. I, I kind of think of the uh, Simon uh, Sinek book, um, Sinek, Sinek, I always forget which way it's pronounced. Um, uh, find your why. I know with my particular journey, uh, I had been doing a number of things over the years that I was like, oh, you know what? Although I either trained for this or thought I wanted to do this, it's not what I expected or what I thought it would be for a number of different reasons. Could be a company I worked for, the people I worked with, anything like that. And it's almost like this constant journey of finding that why, literally that why. I mean, we're, we're at where we are now because of, in part, because of that journey. Uh, it, it brought us together and it also has us doing what we're all doing now with clients. But we're still on that journey. It's not like we're there. We're still constantly mm -hmm. discovering, okay, maybe I'd like to work with different types of people or I'd like to uh, take this to a different venue, whatever the case may be. I'm kind of uh, reaching here because there's a bit of uh, the, you don't know what you don't know, but you know when you're, when you're not, you feel there's still more to go, if that makes sense, or more to do. You know, you kind of feel, yeah, I have this vision that's pulling me, but I'm almost like course correcting and, and going there in a way that maybe it needs to be a little bit that way or a little bit that way. It's um, not just a, a set place. No, and I think that's such an important part to even just accept in the beginning of the journey. Because like when we're 75, we're still going to be doing something, right? We're going to keep hopefully right. be moving towards that. And I feel like people expect to get the dollar amount, to get the girl, to get the job promotion. Oh, and then I'm going to get rid of that feeling of lack or I'm going to get that feeling of enlightenment. That's not how this works. That's unfortunately, you know, not, not it. And I think just understand and sitting with that. Like if a lot of people sat with that, like I, I work with these billionaires and this one guy was just getting mad that his friend was worth $7 billion and he was worth $5 billion. And I'm just like, Jesus Christ, it does not matter how much money you have. If you, if you want a reason to be unhappy, you will find a reason to be unhappy. And then I have another guy. So it's funny, that guy with the 5 billion is upset that his friend is 7 billion. And this guy with 7 billion is telling me somebody's going to come steal his money. And I'm going, what? It's just, it's just 
if, if you do not have the mindset and un- these understandings behind it, you are going to find an issue. Cause I, I could tell this guy, um, the $7 billion guy ended up finding, uh, having a bunch of security set up for his thing. So we gave him physical security, gave him digital security. And now he said, we gave him top agent secret service guys. And he's telling me he doesn't trust the secret service guys. I'm like, listen, th- th- there's something else going on here. It seems like you're just pushing this insecurity from one thing to another thing. And like, there's no, no end in sight. And um, that's what kind of helps me realize, like, you don't chase the money. The money's an, a nice piece to have here, but you have to understand that as you go through your journey, you are evolving. That's what the point is. So if you want to change, then you obviously your values and your aim is going to change just, just slightly um, throughout the process. And I think people think I'm going to keep chasing this one thing for 40 years. Yeah. We're over, we're all ch- changing in, in, and searching for something or helping, but if we're expecting to change, then obviously I'm expecting the outcome of, of what I want to change, right? Yeah, it'll and, modify, and, yeah. And for some people in that million, billion dollar range, their fear or they feel that it's the end of the world if they lose all that. Like you're, you said, the one friend mm-hmm. is afraid of losing it. He feels that's the end of the world. There are countless stories of people who have lost it from taking risks, but if they do, They'll start over again, and they'll and they'll get it back. Mm. Uh, that that's uh, always, you know, was an interesting thing to me. Where somebody who's if they've made it there once, more off the chance is pretty good that they'll make it there again if they do happen to lose it. Sure, because they can modify. I think. Mm-hmm. I think when I'm working with people, one of the most interesting things to me is when we're doing goal setting. We set goals initially, and then there's often some sort of hesitancy. And once I say, listen, we'll just check in each week. I'm only checking in for, to see what works and doesn't, not to judge or review, just to evaluate progress and then decide from there, we'll modify. And and then they're like, oh, good, we can modify. And then they have this comfort level of accepting it. You know, you said it as well, Scott, acceptance kind of helps one move past the hurdles. Yeah, I, for, for me, the biggest thing I've been working on this year is like this idea of acceptance, but like true acceptance, accepting who you are, accepting even like, I didn't realize how judgmental I am of, of human beings. Like just seeing somebody on the train, just fucking, I just want to smack somebody in the face <laughs> and just like understand like that's a problem and trying to, to sit like my, and we're, I was, um you know, we had a Memorial Day weekend barbecue yesterday and the topic of money comes up always with my family because we're Italians, everybody's trying to get into everybody's business. And I'm sitting there just, I'm so interested, not about how much money everybody has, but the relationship people have to money because, you know, everybody's more of that common man in my family of a sanitation worker, a fireman. Everybody's just, you know, working. It's still working. God bless. It's all good. And um, we're talking about the, the risk of taking money. And, and everybody was getting so scared of how I view money because it just doesn't – it comes, it goes, it'll come back. It's just more of a, of a free-flowing thing. We're talking about investing in the stock market and how nervous they were that I invested most of my money in the stock market and now it's all gone. And I was like, but it's not gone. Like, what are you guys talking about? Like, they were it – was, it was the fear of money that was holding them – kind of to their money, I felt like. And I'm the more the person doesn't think about it. And yet I feel like it's always flowing back to me in some way. And I just thought the the, the relationship you have with things or the relationship of how you correlate to the money or to your fear is more important than the actual piece of it itself. Do you know what I'm saying? Am I making sense? Totally make it sense. Mm-hmm. And you, you make yeah. me think of comfort zone. And it, you know, someone's not willing to step outside their comfort zone, or they have a really tight circle of con- personal control, right? Then they're not going to experience as much. And if they're willing to be open like you are and manage your investments with an open mind, more is going to come back into you. But if you're tight with your circle of control, or your comfort zone, nothing's allowed in. There's no space. So you have to be open-minded. Mm-hmm. Now, is kind this something? Interest- yeah, go ahead, Lou. I was just going to say kind of interesting that they're a little hesitant to invest in the stock market. That's been around, you know, decades. And you can look at, you know, the numbers from many, many years to see kind of how things have gone. And yes, you know, when it goes down, it always bounces back up. I'm curious what they think of like cryptocurrency. Oh, you know, forget it. Forget it, Lou. You can't even, yeah. th- you can't even bring it up in my family. I, I'm trying, I was I'm trying to get say, my God. Trying to, and <laughs> the funny thing is I'm sitting there with my statistics. I'm like 75 years of doing this. The market's always, anytime it's dropped over 30% within six months, it's come back over 15%. So it'll move from about you know, down 30, uh, down 30 to up 45 or 50%. So I'm trying to tell them this and they're just not that one piece. I'm like, this is data. This is a, a proof. And you're just, it's just over their head. Well, the market's down. You lost all your money. I'm like, you don't really lose your money in the market. It's more just, you're, you're playing like, and again, I treat everything like a game. I look at it like these are this, there's a branch 
in the video game of money. And I'm trying to get this mon mon money higher than what it was a year ago. And I'm trying to explain to them, like, if you guys leave it sitting in the checking account, you're losing money more than you've ever lost it ever in the history of the world. We're down 11% inflation here. Especially like, now. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And it was, it was just, no matter what I said, it didn't matter. And, you know, the crypto, Lou, was like, they, they think I'm invested in, in, in goddamn, you know, whatever. And I think that yeah. is... Ponzi scheme. Yeah, Ponzi scheme. <laughs> you're just... You're just playing. And listen, I'm not, I'm not a gigantic fan or even a big expert on crypto, but I know that I play... I, I, what you're doing, even betting on the stock market or gambling or whatever you want to call it, it's you're, you're, you're betting on the anticipation of people and how they're going to react to it. And I may not understand crypto, but I know that there's a ton of kids in the 18 to 25, 30-year-old mark that are obsessed with it and really do believe it's the future. So you have to kind of put your trust in other people at some point too, because it's, you know, it's only worth what other people really think it is in the end of the day. Well, and that's a fear. If you fear something that you don't know, either learn about it to figure it out and see if it is still good for you or not, or uh, don't. I mean, you know, you just can't bash something if you don't know anything about it. Mm -hmm. has, 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 has your guys' relationship with money changed? as you've gone deeper into self-development or even your meditations or spirituality or any of that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I have done a lot of uh, like introspection and um, a lot of soul searching, trying to figure shit out. Cause like, the world doesn't make sense a lot of the time. Like a lot of the shit that happens and all that. Um, money is, I mean, it's good to be uh, like stable, but I don't believe that money is like a really good motivator. You know, um, it's just, you reach some point, whatever you want, you want a million dollars. When you get there, you're just going to want more. Right. And I think people create an identity around material shit and money. And I think it's more important to like, you could do that, but also you need to, you know, have good values, you know, core values with, um, with yourself, how you treat other people. Um, also the relationship that you have with yourself you know, I think that we're all very quick to tell people that we love, that we love them, be compassionate to others and all that, but we don't do the same for ourselves, mm. you know? That's well said. Well and said. I think I hear you that money is a, it's a motivator, maybe not a good one because it could take you down a road that doesn't give you what you really need back, right? Like, so maybe you're getting more money but you're not getting understanding acceptance or compassion or partnership right. in life yeah and i think too many people look at money as just what it's going to get me if it is going to get me that yacht or that mansion or that, that whatever you know there are people who get a much bigger high or a rush from actually using that to help others give back to the community build a homeless shelter do whatever you know there's countless studies out there that say that it gives us a lot more satisfaction in life is helping others and oftentimes I hear that as that is the meaning of life is helping others. Um, so it, whether you have a lot of money or no money, that you, you can get that same level of satisfaction and happiness from, from being more compassionate, self-compassionate, as Kevin mentioned, and, and helping others all, you know, lift us all up, bring exactly. us all on a, a positive journey. And, and I think there's something that you lose as a person let's say if i want and i've i've tested this this year this year i said i'm gonna try to you know maybe leave my job or something let me just focus more on making money and saving it so let's hit this x dollar 300 whatever the number is and there's something that i lost i feel like by focusing on the future of of that number right whether it's happening or not is really irrelevant because you start focusing on that it's like you're just focusing on a game basically and again for me coming back to it, it's like what 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 are, you, what are you wasting your time on and then i think you throw in you know, the, I feel like the, the world is trying to teach me a lesson. Like, Scott, you're trying to make money. It's not going to happen. Like, the market's going to crash, and then crypto's going to go down. Like, it's not happening this year. So it was, like, for me, a double-edged sort of, like, you can't really force everything. Um, but also, even what I gave up of worrying about that, in, even looking at, you know, the, the, the experiences I lost of, you know, trying to stay in an extra night or trying to do this, for me, 
it's just better. I think when you find that nice balance of being able to save it, focusing to an extent on it, like just putting it in and then having it be your overarching goal. Like I feel like that became the overarching goal for me this quarter. It was like, what was, was it really worth it? And it's not, honestly, it's just, it's never really worth it. Scott, you just shared a perfect example of, and we talk about this, but this is also known in the wellness industry about focusing on the process, not the outcome. And when you were so focused on the outcome of needing X dollars, you weren't finding any satisfaction with it. And when you were able to focus on the process, the, the joy came out of the things that you were doing. And then the, the outcome still came. So yeah, that was a prime example process. Yeah, it, it, all this stuff, like it pops up over and over again. I just think it takes time for it to actually sit in and like condition with yourself because you're fighting with the world. You're fighting with even these external facts, my family in one case, the scenario, and even, you know, just, well, well, when are you going to get that piece of house? When are you going to buy this or that? And I've just kind of accepted, like, I just work differently. I, I, I prefer to be flexible. And I think everybody's in different situations. The person who's about to get married with children is in a different situation than I'm in where I'm kind of just free flowing and I want to truly have that freedom. And there's this, when we talk about freedom, I don't mean freedom of choice. Cause then would it, I'm still bogged down to choices. Then I want true freedom. I just like to be. And when you start being able to, to not worry about that, like there's something that happened right after my divorce of when you made amount of money and then you don't have to worry about it anymore. And I really prefer not worrying about money. It's not, it's not a thing in my mind. It's just, it, I feel like it flows. I flow better almost when I'm not, it's not even a thought. Obviously we're going to pay for stuff. We're going to have to pay the, the bills and stuff, but like, it's just feels truly like what freedom should feel like. You know what I'm saying? Am I making sense? Yeah. And I actually think you would make more the general you <laughs> and, and you too. Uh, by not worrying about it, you know, when if you're constantly worrying about money all the time, that's taking energy away from activities that could help you to make money. Mm -hmm. You know, in the, I wanted to share real quickly one aspect of the whole thing with targeting numbers. I know that's a thing in the business world. I was in corporate America for many, many years, and that was all about budgeting and planning. Everything was focused on numbers, 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 obvious reasons. That's how everything kind of works. However, when you don't hit a target, it's seen as a failure. Oh, we didn't make a million. We only made $999,999 on that line of business. I worked in the insurance field. Uh oh, is that a failure? You know, that always uh, struck me as are you kidding me? You're so, you're right in the ballpark. It can't be seen as a failure. And that's why I also work with people in the, in the wellness industry, as Nancy does. And when with weight management, numbers aren't even a thing. Don't even step on the scales about how you feel, how you look. Because if you focus on that number and you're like, oh, I didn't hit that weight loss goal that I had, boom. You're going to probably get back to old habits and start to feel bad about yourself. All the emotional baggage comes back in. Just focusing on the numbers is a terrible thing to do, in my opinion. Yeah, for, for me, even, <clears throat> even like if you're going to want to hit the number or something or you're going to want to lose the weight, there's that implication again like that if you don't hit it, you're, you're failing. But th does that really even exist? And I, and I know you guys did an, an episode on truth. Um, I believe it was the last episode you did. And I was very curious to see what, did you guys have any cool revelations off of truth and what reality is and what is an illusion? What is not, how was that episode? And what, what did you guys get out of that? I think that uh, was no. Kevin's, uh, yeah. Well, we, I ha we have no idea what right? the truth is or what reality is or what the fuck we're doing here on this planet. <laughs> you know, we don't know. So I think, the best thing we can do is focus on abundance, focus on helping each other instead of arguing about shit, you know, fighting with uh, one another. What is, what is life? What is reality? You know, um, we don't know. We don't know the truth. And we don't even know if if there's something in between truth and untruth, either we were having a debate on that. Everyone's truth is different too. So each person's experience is different, what they believe, where the values are, where their faith is just in, in what's acceptable or not is different for everybody. So your truth is, is your own. And the, I think key is being honest with yourself about that truth and nobody knows, but you inside. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when you think about it, like we are floating through a galaxy in space on a rock right now. That's what's happening. That's, that's <laughs> truth. 
And I was thinking yeah. about this. I mean, I was a little high last night. I'm not going to lie to you. I was sitting there thinking about it. I'm like, <laughs> what am I stressing about? But when you take it from like a higher perspective, like just totally pull yourself out of it. I was like, what am I stressing about? And I, I think that is the issue for me, at least like every little minute thing or something pops up, doesn't quite go my way. It becomes the big issue and it kind of worlds out in your brain and you lose that side of abundance and fulfillment and, you know, that whole kind of jazz of, it's really just how you look at life perspective, perspective for me and perception is, has been the, the one tool like that you could use for greatness or you could use for just to ruin yourself basically. And truth is closely linked to belief. You know, we all have a belief system that we've developed over the years based on experience, based on information that we've gained, et cetera. But you know, we've talked about this probably in that very same episode, how for some reason, these days, it seems much harder for folks to want to change their beliefs, even in the face of some evidence that might help them to, to see something differently. You know, we're not, we're not going to go into all the possible causes of all that. Um, and it could just be that it's more visible now than, you know, in years past. But, uh, you know, if you believe something, that's your truth. It's going to be like that for the rest of your life if you're never going to believe otherwise. Why do you guys think, because even with, you know, if everybody's listening to this, this is the last week in May and there's a lot, quite a bit of, let's just say, unrest in the, the school world with these shootings. Like, why do you think so many people are living in different realities or against guns or for guns? or Like, for me, I don't care about the gun issue because I don't think the guns have anything to do with it. If somebody wants to shoot a gun, they're going to find a gun. It's about what's going on in people's minds. Um, really for me and what what is not only going on in people's mind but why are we living in these different worlds where we all can't get on the same page about at least saving children something so you know i feel like something really terrible even worse than this has to happen for us to all kind of snap out of it what do you guys think about that <laughs> it's a, a very complex subject let's put it that way we're all yeah. kind of <laughs> yeah i don't know i mean i there's just there's a lot of things that go into that entire debate with uh, economics, with financial security, with uh, classism, sexism, ageism, all these things. I mean, we can go down the list, but I, it, there's also the scarcity mindset that sometimes comes into play if something, if someone else has, and I don't have, uh, but I think it's, it, it's so complex that it really, there's no simple solution. And what where we're at now, in my opinion, is it's either all or nothing. All guns or no guns. All this or none of that. It's, it, there doesn't seem to be any room for compromise because everyone uh, is, seems to be slowly falling into those two camps. Or the loudest ones are in those two camps. And they're the yeah. ones that are, we're hearing the most from. Yeah, absolutely. And then yet to, to Scott's point, all of those recent situations in this year, and let alone the last last month, um, tie back to a person where there's been signs of some kind leading up to the events that have occurred. And so what are we as humans not doing, seeing, and supporting in other humans? Because these situations are happening and it's heartbreaking. So Ooh. mental health is a thing, sorry. Um, you know, we're, we're all proud to say the physical workouts we do, you know, we're proud to say the food plans we're on, but we're not proud to say we're working on our mental health and people aren't comfortable to say they need support with their mental health. We need to get there. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Lou. Go. Well, well, I was just going to add one thing. Nancy and I may be the only two in this group that kind of remember this, but many, many years ago, there was a lot more emphasis <laughs> on, <too> young. <laughs> <laughs> on, on mental health where there were a lot of institutions. And I can't remember, maybe Nancy, you can help me out uh, under one particular president who literally, uh, you know, signed laws or did something where he disbanded and closed a lot of those institutions. And the, the vision I got was just all of these folks with mental health issues were just put on the street and maybe with one bottle of pills and sent on their way. And, you know, not that that's is specifically a cause for what's going on now, but that shows that there, you know, for that one period of time was little emphasis on mental health and as nancy mentioned it's you may not see it but it's extremely important to address that just like physical health agreed but there's also this element that there are other solutions for these people that we're getting put away if you will and there are solutions we offer solutions as a team of people the four of us offer, offer solutions to other people and there is support and solutions that aren't medication and aren't being 
um, confined. And so where's the balance? That's hard to know. We need to figure that out. But we want people to know that there are people like us out here willing to support all of those in need. And yeah, that like, comes back to why we're doing this sort of stuff. Yeah, mm-hmm. no, of course. And even l- listen, I think implementing change is, is for people like us who are helping more smaller groups of people. And you can make a little drop in the net, but like from from the government standpoint, just make a mental checkup every year. Like I get a physical checkup. Why can't I get a mental checkup? Mm-hmm. You know, be that would be wonderful. At least start with making a real change. And maybe the go- you know trying to make a change in the government is just too too much of a thing here. But just really ex- like understanding that there's an issue and even coming back to loose point with the black and white, like that's a, just not having people think less like that. This tribalism of, you know, the X and Y of, because that, that is what kind of gets the, the clicks nowadays is these wacky people. I, I, I do think what we see on social media and what we feel is that of two extremes here. Cause I feel like most of us are right in the middle. Like, listen, I want to make some money. I want to, I'm, I'm pretty socially um, acceptable. Everybody can be gay, trans, whatever you want, but I want to make some money and I'm fiscally more conservative. Like, I feel like if you took, if you took a survey, 80, 90, 90% of us would be right down the middle. And maybe we would disagree on the he, him thing or this or that, like things that don't quite matter. But at some point um, there's going to have to be like real change. And I, I, I don't, I feel like we keep saying this and it keeps getting pushed till it's becoming, you know, like, I don't want to keep bringing up kids dying every, you know, 20 kids getting shot for no reason, just because there's not uh, a Marine in, in a school or something like that. These simple, even just instead of giving $40 billion to Ukraine, just give it, give a billion to pay for these security guys to work in the schools, you know? And it could be that one happens. little thing at a time. You know, Nancy mentioned baby steps. Hey, yeah. if you can't design some huge uh, piece of legislation that addresses this whole thing, A to Z, do one thing. Like you said, some armed guard in a school, something like that. Yeah. And it, did you guys ever hear of um of Indra's net, the net of Indra? Is that something familiar? You guys ever heard of that? Mm-hmm. So I, I'll suggest I've been just digging into the spirituality stuff, but the net of Indra, it's like a metaphor for the structure of reality. And it describes as each there's like a million different nets, and it's like a each net is basically a little jewel that is clear and reflects all the other jewels. And the way that you're supposed to look at that is each jewel is an individual being or an, or an individual uh, consciousness, right? And every consciousness or every jewel is kind of intimately connected with everything and it's reflect. So there's no way to ever actually understand what is good for you and what is bad for you. Coming back to Kevin's point about truth and reality, because you never know what's good or bad. Like if I um, lose all my money, but I become depressed and end up sitting in my house. I could have got hit by a car the next week. Like there's all these little things that you really can never actually understand. So for me, it always comes back to under, just being the, having the highest quality mind in every single situation, truly being present and truly being able to like have that acceptance and that gratitude in every moment and just building that up. And I think people get a little cra- nervous because they say, well, I can't do that for the rest of my life. Well, that's, the, that's what I'm saying. Don't look at it for the rest of your life. Don't worry about that. Worry about today. Worry about now. And if you start doing that, I think you start getting more of like a, a clarity and a richness, not only with your vo- with your goals and values, but just in conversations with people, just in like understanding. Like for me, the highest value of these conversations having, like this is why I do the podcast, this is why I rip these out, because like this is the highlight of my day. It's going to be, this is it. And then, you know, hopefully we'll get a couple emails helping people. Like those two are the highest values for me. It's easy. No money, no fame, no anything will do it. But those things for me. Um, I know that for a fact, those are my highest values. I think if everybody got some clarity on what their values are and then took slow mitigated action toward it, one little thing, a half hour a day towards your action, um, we would all be a lot, a lot happier. For sure. We all say the same when we're done recording our own episodes. We're like, okay, that feels good. We're empowered for the day. We're usually, (laughs) we might start out going, what the hell are we talking about today? And by the time we finish, we're like, damn, that was good. It just goes (laughs) off. It's wonderful. Now, what, what is the one thing Um, that each of you would say has helped your life create abundance or fulfillment? And what would you suggest people do um, in that way to help them create their abundance of fulfillment? Hmm. Well, I can tell you for sure that my biggest aha moment came from one, the word awareness comes from me all the time. Mm -hmm. And my awareness was recognizing that my intentions and my behaviors weren't aligned in some instances and so I thought of myself in in a certain way yet I wasn't taking any actions to be that and once I became aware of that I was like oh shit (laughs) you know 
so I had to make some shifts, but, um, so I don't know, I guess I'd say awareness, but that's why, cause my actions weren't, weren't in line. Yeah. Um, for me, I would say it is authenticity, living authentically for myself, not worrying about what people think, not making decisions based on what other people want, you know, um, just being true to myself, but also putting myself into a mental and emotional state where I know what the things are that I should be doing that are going to help elevate me, uh, put me in a higher emotional state, um, making decisions that are aligned with my values. So yeah, uh, authenticity. Well, wow, Kevin, you just stole my thunder. That's what I <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, I mean, I can relate to both what, what you and Nancy said. And, and, the, and the thing with the, uh, the authenticity, it, it also brought to mind for me is something that uh, we talked about earlier, fear and letting go of the past. <clears throat> I, for the longest time, uh, you know, work is a big part of our lives. We work nine to five, at least back in my day, it was like strictly nine to five. Now it's all over the place. But that's a big chunk of our life is working. I allowed myself to be in situations where when I would work for a company, I would think this is where I'm going to stay the rest of my life. I got to do my best. I got to show them how good I am, how loyal I am, all this stuff. And breaking free from that to me was a bad thing. It showed that I maybe failed, even though I have now a completely different mindset. As far as you know what, if you're not getting somewhere where you want to be at a certain place, change it up, go somewhere else and, and just hop over into a different ladder and, and keep climbing that way. Back in my day, something my parents used to say on a regular basis. Now I find myself saying it myself all the time. You know, that was a thing. You worked for one company your whole life. You retired, you had a pension. There was no 401ks. It was none of that business. And it was all about, if you didn't do that, you were a failure. And believe it or not, it took me many years to come to a point where I realized, you know what? No, I can, as Kevin mentioned, be my own self, do what I want to do, hop here and there and not be afraid to do it and not look at myself as being a failure and that's simply the past holding you back at that point right it's something you knew and believed or the people around you knew and believed and so their values were in that and there's nothing wrong with it it's just a prime example of the past creating a barrier to the future yeah. one of the things scott that we talk about in our podcast well i should say i do and kevin and nancy always make fun of me as i'll bring <laughs> up family issues here it goes because boy i have yeah so many interesting family stories to share but i realized that that was a huge drag on me mentally spiritually in so many ways and when i finally understood more about where my family was coming from and not allow them to kind of pull me into some of their negative spaces that helped me to move on as well i mean that's a you know, sometimes, Cheers. And, and my family's great. I love them all. But I, I think, Scott, you probably can relate. There's there's just some things with family members that, you know, you just can't relate to. You find a little annoying. could be great in there. I'm going but, to deal with it in a barbecue now. Lou. I'm exactly. Gonna with, I'm, I'm going to prepare myself. For, and I've re I realized, like, with my aunts, you deal with 65, 70-year-old women who think you should be in this box. And, like, it's all beliefs, right? It's 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 just the like, – I've learned just don't take things personally because it's like you're just yeah. trying – they want what's best for you. And I think we've hit most of these, um, what's the, the four agreements? I feel like we hit all of them. Nancy said the, uh, the you know, congruency with herself, be, be impeccable with your word. Don't take things personally. I'm hitting that. Um, no, that's, that's really cool. And I, I think if, if anybody's listening, just um, make yourself aware first. Just, that's that first step is awareness. Um, and I, we've all kind of touched on, on that piece. And from there, I think if you're able to sit by yourself with your thoughts a little bit more, because in today's world, I don't think taking action is really the issue. I think a little passivity would be nice and just be able to sit and, and calm down and just understand what do I want, lie it out. And that's the best part of life is it's the meaning that you give it. So you get to make it whatever you want. So, And how much house cleaning do I need to do? How yeah. much? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. So um, that is it. Thank you guys so much for watching, for listening. The team from Clean Your Fucking House. Bitch, I said the whole thing and I don't give a shit. Uh, you can find the podcast uh, in the notes below. Thank you guys so much for joining me. Seriously, I appreciate it. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Scott. Us. Yeah, Thank thanks for having us, Scott. Oh, of course. Uh, YouTube, do me a favor. Hit that like button. 
Uh, subscribe, leave a review if you're listening. Thank you guys so much for being with us two years strong here. It's not stopping. As always, stay safe, stay positive, stay blessed. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.